it's my great pleasure to introduce a good friend and a colleague, Dr. Eric Monet. Dr. Monet is a professor at Colorado State University specializing in small animal surgery. Dr. Monet was one of the first to describe the role of laparoscopic surgery in veterinary medicine. He's taught veterinarians both nationally and internationally over 20 years. He's the founder of Veterinary Endoscopy Society and their first president. president. He will be presenting laparoscopic cholecystectomy. I think on just a little personal note, Eric just removed my own dog's gallbladder laparoscopically three weeks ago. My dog Blueberry, a border terrier, 12 years old, um, was completely asymptomatic and had a very early um, mucosal, and we elected to remove it. My dog was almost completely normal the day following surgery. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Monet. Thank you, Dave, um, for the introduction, and um, thank you for inviting me uh, to present this uh, seminar on laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And um, that's definitely a, a big field in mini invasive surgeries, especially in dogs. And as you all know, I mean, um, we do cholecystectomies in dogs mostly for cholecystitis, maybe some sludge or mucosy. That's the main indication in the veterinary field uh, right now for, for dogs. And um, the big question on the mucosal is, do they have an obstruction or no obstructions of their biliary system, which should change completely the prognosis of those, of those patients. And um, we do those uh, cholecystectomies mostly, and I would say probably 90% of the time right now, uh, for blood, gallbladder mucosal with bile duct obstruction. And um, that's associated with a pretty high mortality rate. I mean, eight, nine years ago, probably a lot of papers came out at the same time. One of them came out of CSU with one of my residents, Dr. Amsalem, and everybody published pretty much the same outcome with kind of a mortality rate of 25 to 30%, which is fairly high, okay? And when you talk to an owner and say, hey, I mean, we need to do a cholecystectomy on your dog, he's kind of having some early signs, yes, having signs of uh, bile duct obstruction with or without peritonitis. I mean, that's a pretty grave prognosis to give to an owner there, okay? And uh, that's what triggers some interest to do something different in those dogs and see if we can do something better. And um, we've all seen that. We've all seen dogs being presented with gallbladder mucosils without an obstruction. Either they are incidental findings because we do ultrasound for something else. I mean, seeing a dog being presented with um, some vomiting, diarrhea, and you don't have really clear explanation of that. And you decide to do an ultrasound, you do blood work, you do ultrasound, and then you find a very early uh, gallbladder mucosal there. So that's what's happening in some of those cases. And until very recently, we ignore those cases, or at least we didn't do surgery on those cases. And um, I was lucky here to be at CSU and work with Dr. Tweed, which is, who is very interested about all the liver disease and gallbladder disease. And he was working in those, uh, those cases. And the routine here that we've been following here at CSU for quite a few years now, and I know a lot of internists are doing the same thing also now, it's not just us, but um, follow those dogs with gallbladder mucosal, even if they're not obstructed, if they were kind of incidental findings, they are getting in some medical treatment, okay? And there is different medical treatment that can be used. I'm not going to go into those details today. And um, usually what we've been doing here and what Dr. Tweed has been doing and recommending us to do is kind of follow up those dogs for three to six months with the appropriate medical treatment and following them up with ultrasound and see if the gallbladder mucosal is getting better, is it getting worse, is it staying the same? And if definitely if we don't see any improvement into the gallbladder mucosal, I mean, then recommend to do surgery in those cases. And it's interesting that um, in the literature two years ago, there was a very good paper published by Dr. Yon where 
they looked at those dogs where surgery was done, kind of an elective surgery, okay? After following up those dogs with medical treatment, appropriate medical treatment for several months, then they decided to do surgery. So none of those dogs were in a crisis. None of those dogs were done kind of an emergency situation. None of those dogs had peritonitis or any of that stuff. And big surprise, I mean, those dogs had a much better outcome. Okay, the mortality rate in that study was kind of like 2%. So it's a dramatic improvement from going from 30% to 2%, okay? And um, that was kind of a nice uh, publication to see at that time that will support our approach of doing those surgery much earlier than we would have done in the past. So which bring the idea of the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, okay? I mean, you all know that in the human field, I mean, laparoscopic cholecystectomy is kind of what got laparoscopy to start in human, okay? Many, many years ago, they started to do those laparoscopic cholecystectomy, mostly in humans, is for gallbladder stones. And when they do those surgeries, more or less, they do cholangiograms pretty much all the time, either during the surgery or just before surgery, to localize where the stones are located or making sure there is no other obstruction. But basically, laparoscopic cholecystectomy now is considered as the gold standard in humans. Okay, so if you're diagnosed with a gallbladder issues, 99% of chance that they are going to recommend to do those uh, surgeries with, um, with laparoscopy. So basically right now for me and for us here at the university at Colorado State University, and I think for most of the surgeons I know that are doing laparoscopic cholecystectomies, um, our, most com our number one indications is to do obviously gallbladder mucosine I've done a few dogs with just some sludge. I've done a few dogs with just cholecystitis, but I would say our number one indication is a gallbladder mucosine, and it, they have to be non-obstructed. I don't feel comfortable right now taking a dog with signs of obstructions of his bile duct uh, to surgeries with laparoscopy. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm going to change my mind um, sooner or later, but that's the number one uh, clinic things I'm going to look for. Also, obviously, I will not take a dog that has signs of, of peritonitis, okay, or signs of perforation, which means on ultrasound, they look pretty uh, echo-dense or very bright wall of the gallbladder. I will stay away from those cases right now. I will not feel very comfortable doing that. Then obviously, if they have peritonitis, I think for me, will be a contraindication to the surgery. But now in surgery, in human surgery, they start to recommend to do laparoscopy for peritonitis anyway. So maybe it's something that is going to evolve in the future. So I want to take a first break here to know if you have any questions, because I know um, it's a big topic and it's a big uh, subject of discussion here. How you decide and what do you decide to take to surgery? What kind of cases? So I don't know if you have any questions right now, Dave, or... Yeah, actually, we don't have any questions right now. Um, I would imagine that maybe as, as we go on, we'll have some more questions come up. Okay, I'll keep going. So it brings the question of how do we know this bile duct is patent, okay? That's always a big question we have. And I first look at blood work, obviously. I mean, if bilirubin level is in a uh, normal level, that's it's a very good indication that more likely the biliary system is patent, okay? But I've seen dogs that if you look in their history, they had sometimes some elevated uh, bilirubin level and they went back down to normal and they went back up. So always those cases are kind of always a little bit worrisome for me. I mean, are we going to get into a bad situation in surgery? or in a post-operative period. So that's when we restart to rely on some um, imaging techniques. And like I already mentioned uh, in, uh, in the previous slides is in human cholangiogram, it's not almost, a it's not a requirement, but almost, okay? And I know some different countries deal differently. I know in Europe, they are pretty much required to do a cholangiogram for any cholecystectomies they are going to do in a human patient. So it's something we need to work on and figure out. So like I said, I use ultrasound as my first uh, image techniques to see what's happening. 
So you can see in those cases here, they have some early um, gold bladder mucosines with some dilated bile ducts. So those cases with dilated bile ducts, I will probably decide to go with surgery, okay? An open surgery, not a laparoscopy. But we know I've been fooled by that, okay? I had this case, for example, and I had several of those where the ultrasound say, hey, the biliary system looks normal, bilirubin looks normal, and then we go with laparoscopy and that's what we found, okay? So very distended common bile duct, very distended cystic duct, and the gallbladder doesn't look the best, okay? You can see the apex of the gallbladder is already getting pretty bad color here. It's not necrotic, it hasn't ruptured. So ultrasound is not always that reliable to use for that. I mean, we've had some bad surprises. It's this very interesting paper that was published in AJVR now three years ago by Dr. Chow. And um, they tried to use CT scan to try to do cholangiography. And it's a technique that's used in human, okay? And they use this gadoxidic acid that they're going to inject to the patient and it's all done under sedation, and that's what they've done in those cases. And it gives you some kind of a cholangiogram. And the problem with this technique is uh, shows you some nice um, anatomy of the, of the biliary system, but visualizing the cystic duct was not that good. So the details of the images does not allow a very good diagnosis. Yes, this cystic duct, or yet, no, this cystic duct is patent, or yes, the col the common bile duct is patent or not, it's not patent. So it's not a great technique yet, okay? There's probably some improvement to do there, but it's something that might be very interesting in the future if we can figure out that technique a little bit better because now if we can screen more cases, then it will open uh, more cases for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Obviously, we can do cholangiograms, okay? And especially if you have a dog uh, that only has sludge, okay, that doesn't have a mucosine already, you can easily go percutaneously, okay, and like you can see in the video at the bottom here, percutaneously stick a, a long spinal needle into the gallbladder and then inject contrast, okay. That's a pretty good technique to use that we've used a couple of times, not very commonly, but I've used it couple of times. So you have to do your laparoscopy and the fluoroscopy at the same time. Or if you have an hybrid OR, you can do everything in the same OR, but not everybody has access to that. And you're going to get the kind of image you see on the left side here, where you can see the gallbladder and you can see a normal patent cystic duct and a patent common bile duct. So give you a lot of information and a good detail here. Also, what I've done in two or three cases now that I've placed a percutaneous pigtail catheter and a laparoscopy, and then we were able to do the contrast study. As you can see, the contrast material is going through the common bile duct and it up into the duodenum. Also, this technique is really good because you can use it just to decompress the biliary system. Okay, if you're really concerned your patient is not very stable, not able to go to surgery right away for some reason, you can still use those pigtail catheters and keep them in place for a few days. Decompress the, the biliary system if you feel that it's needed. And that's a very nice technique to use. And it's used in human a lot. And I've used it in a couple of dogs. But anyway, it can be used to do a cholangiogram if you only have a sludge. If you have a mucosium, which means it's already organized into that gelatinous material, injecting contrast directly in the gallbladder probably will not work. Okay, so you have to find a way to bypass the gallbladder. And that's what they will do in human very commonly. Okay, they have a special catheters with a special instrument. So they can go and expose the cystic duct like you can see on the bottom left picture and then they can feed the catheter down the cystic duct and then inject contrast and then figure out if yes or not the common bile duct is patent or not. I've been practicing this technique, okay, in cadavers, okay, and um, it looks like it's feasible in dogs. And you get those nice pictures of the biliary system, okay, into the liver going all the way down into the common bile duct. I know Dr. Kanai in Japan has been doing this. He reported a study 
over 76 cases, and he did the cholangiogram in a fair number of those dogs successfully with this technique, okay? So it's something that is possible, okay? Now, the only concern I have with this technique is you have to open the cystic duct, and then if you end up with a patient that has an obstruction of the common bile duct, then it's going to be much harder to take care of this patient if the cystic duct has been open or transected already, then we have a, a difficult situation in our hands. So we really need to figure out what we can do with these techniques, but it's definitely something that is worth investigating and pursuing. Now, somebody can argue is, do we really need to do this with a mucosil? I mean, when was the last time you find a mucosil with an obstruction of the common bile duct? Personally, it's been a long time since I've seen that. And I know there is some research being done right now and some um, publications coming out very soon about patency and the need to do those cholangiogram or at least cassarize the common bile duct in dogs. So maybe it's a moot point, maybe we don't have to do that. Um, but anyway, it's a technique that exists and it's out there and it's worth investigating in dogs. So when I do laparoscopic cholecystectomies, I mean, I started by doing it with multiple cannulas. So usually four cannulas, that's what I needed, okay, for that. And I place the patient in dorsal recumbency. And I've used a kind of a reverse trade lumbar uh, positioning for quite a while, and then I'm not using it anymore. I don't think it gives me much help. So now I keep them just in dorsal recumbency and I'm going to uh, grab the gallbladder with a forceps to try to elevate the gallbladder into the abdominal cavity. And now, um, for quite a few years now, I switched to using a single incision laparoscopic access system now with a seal sport. So I use a seal sport and I try to do a few uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomies with only the seal sport, which was kind of possible, but was kind of a struggle. So now I use a combination of a single access port plus an extra cannula, okay? So some people will argue it's not single uh, incision laparoscopy now since we put an extra cannula next to it. The nice benefits of using a seal sport is that you already have a nice incision two centimeter long that will be useful at the end to retrieve the gallbladder through that incision. And then you're using the extra cannula to facilitate the procedure. If you read the human literature, um, they do that a lot, okay? They're going to add an extra cannula to a seal sport, especially when they do cholecystectomy to facilitate the surgery. So I don't think we're too much off by doing a single incision approach with an extra cannula. So that's kind of how I position my cannula. If I use a multiple cannula approach, you can see the liver, you can see the monitor is towards the head of the dog towards a little bit the, the right, the left side of, of the patient here, okay? And uh, so I have the camera caudal to the umbilicus through a five millimeter uh, cannula. And then I'm going to distribute my three other uh, cannulas uh, on each side of the abdominal cavity. And then I'm going to put a 10 millimeter cannula just cranial to the umbilicus. We need a 10 millimeter cannula because to place the um, stapling equipment in place in there and then to put the retrieving bag, okay? So that's going to be helpful. And what I try to do is place the five millimeter cannula for the camera and the 10 millimeter cannula fairly close to each other. Because then when I'm ready to retrieve the, uh, the gallbladder, I can connect those two incisions and then I end up with only one incision 15 millimeter long that's good enough to retrieve the gold ladder this way. And then I have my two five millimeter cannulas on each side so where I can introduce instruments to do my dissection. So probably when you start to do those surgeries, if you're not really familiar with laparoscopic cholecystectomy, it starts with this, okay? And then when you're getting more familiar with the technique, you can switch to the single incision approach. I mean, the single incision approach is a little bit more trickier, when, a bit more tricky when you get started because your hands are a bit close from each other. And so it makes it a little bit more difficult. So get familiar with a regular standard approach, then move to that, okay? And like I said, I put the seal sport 
color to the umbilicus. So I go maybe a centimeter color to the umbilicus, so then we're not in the falciform ligament, okay? And I put a 12 millimeter cannula in there because I use that to get the, um, the endoclip applicator and get the retrieving bags through that. And then I put the camera and an instrument to the five millimeter um, cannula. And then I put the other instrument cannula either on the left side or the right side. Okay, and I've done both. And um, if I put my extra cannula on the left side, it's because I'm going to use it for retraction at the time of surgery. Or if I put it on the right side, is to place my dissecting instrument. Okay, so I'm going to put a, a right angle forceps through the right cannula, through the five millimeter on the right side. And to tell you the truth, that's what I do now most of the time. I find it much easier uh, this way, okay? So the last probably five or six cases I did, that's how I just set it up, okay? And uh, placing the dissecting forceps this way makes it fairly easy. Yes, the dissecting forceps have to go around the um, falciform ligaments. And so sometimes tilting the dog a little bit towards the right side is going to uh, move the, the little bit of the uh, falciform ligament a bit away from the surgical feet. So here you can see in surgery, we have the seal sport placed uh, colon to the uh, umbilicus, and then we have the extra cannula on the side with uh, the dissecting forceps. Here you have many hands in the field. It's because we are a teaching institution and students and residents and everybody wants to scrub in but it's a two person procedure. So you don't have that many hands into your surgical field usually. But you can see there is very limited motion, okay? And if you place your instruments correctly and manipulate them correctly, see, so it's not much clashing during the procedure. So that's the kind of view you're going to get, okay? You're going to see very nicely the common, uh, the cystic duct here, and you can see the attachment of the gold ladder along the liver parenchyma. Sometimes you might see like on this case, you're going to see that uh, very superficial branch of a portal vein. So you always have to be concerned if you see that and be very careful during your dissection. But usually that branch of the portal vein gets peeled off very nicely away from the rest of the, of the gold ladder. So when we're going to dissect this uh, cystic duct, which is usually the first step of the surgery, um, we're going to be able to dissect the cystic duct and the cystic artery together. You can see here in this case, it's very unusual, but you can clearly see the cystic artery, okay? And the good thing in dog, the cystic artery is extremely close, like I already said, versus in human, the cystic artery is a little bit away from the uh, cystic duct. So in humans, if you read human papers, they clip and clamp the cystic artery separately from the cystic duct, which in dogs, we usually don't have to do that, okay? Sometime you may have a branch of the quadrate lobe that is getting into the cystic duct. It can happen, it's not very common to see that. And I've seen it in a couple of dogs and I've ligated my cystic, cystic duct the, the same way, so it probably obstructed that branch of the quadrate lobe. And those dogs did extremely fine, they didn't have any problem in the long term, okay? So you know those liver lobes are never completely independent, so they probably reroute the bile in another system, in another liver lobe, so another uh, bile duct, so it didn't seem to create a problem. So that branch of the quadrate lobe doesn't seem to be a big problem. So when we do the dissection uh, during the surgery, uh, we are going to start usually from the bile duct, okay? That's what is a preferred technique, okay? I was starting originally, the first few cases I did, I started from the apex of the gallbladder, and then I switched from the, uh, to start my dissection from the bile duct. Makes it much easier, okay? And I'm going to show you how to place your grasping forceps. It's again a trick I learned from human stuff, how to place your grasping forceps to make it much easier, okay? But there is some cases that um, if the gallbladder is too big, I had a few cases where the gallbladder was pretty large, okay, without any obstruction of the biliary system. And then when you have a very large gallbladder, it's very heavy and it's hard to manipulate it. 
So in those cases, I start to my dissection from the apex of the gallbladder because it's too hard to visualize the cystic duct. So my approach of choice is starting from the bile duct as much as I can. If I cannot do that, I'll move to the cystic duct, okay? And uh, so uh, the dissection from the, the cystic duct is going to be done with the right angle forceps. So you're going to need a right angle forceps or kind of an uh, articulated forceps. You're going to need electrocautery and a vessel sealant device to help you provide a good hemostasis. And then it's good to have some kind of suction irrigation uh, system if you need to, if you start to get a bit more, too much bleeding from the liver parenchyma to keep your surgical field clean, an irrigation suctioning device is going to be very useful. So you can see here in these cases, um, the exposure of the cystic duct is very good. Okay, we're always kind of in the middle of the quadrate lobe and the left middle lobe and the uh, right middle lobe. So they're always part of the surgical field here. But if you manipulate correctly your gallbladder, you're going to be able to visualize that cystic duct very nicely. Okay, so you can see here, I'm grabbing the gallbladder with my five millimeter grasping forceps. I'm not afraid to do this, okay? I've perforated one gallbladder with the forceps probably because of my fault, okay? I was probably a bit too aggressive with the way I was manipulating the gallbladder. I've done plenty of cholecystectomies now with laparoscopy and I haven't reproduced that problem, okay? So I'm not afraid to grab it. I know some people have been using percutaneous sutures that they anchor into the edges of the gallbladder to do that. I know Dr. Kanaid likes to do this. Personally, I don't do that, okay? But that's my own preferences here. And that's the trick I learned from the human uh, surgeons, okay? I use two grasping forceps. One is going to be at the apex. And like I said at the beginning, I'm using these forceps to elevate the gallbladder towards the ventral uh, abdomen wall, okay? To elevate it there. And then I'm going to put another forceps closer to the cystic duct, like you can see in the video here. And this forceps here is going to pull the gallbladder the, uh, towards the colon and on the side, so towards uh, the right side of the abdominal cavity. By doing this, you're going to really open this angle in between the gallbladder, the cystic duct, and the common bile duct. So by doing this maneuver, you're going to clearly open that space, and that's what is recommended in human to avoid clipping at the same time that you're clipping the cystic duct, clipping the common bile duct, okay? And that's a very common mistake to do in human because the cystic duct in human is fairly short. In dogs, we are lucky the cystic duct is much longer, so that risk is probably a little bit more limited. But if you do that maneuver with those two grasping forceps, you get a beautiful exposure of the cystic duct, and also then you don't need a retractor, okay? Because your two forceps, if you place them correctly, are holding the quadrate lobe and the right middle lobe out of your way. So then you get a very nice exposure of the cystic duct. So then when I get that, okay, I can create two little windows around the cystic duct on each side that I'm going to connect with my right angle forceps here to get a nice plane of dissection. And that's a whole difficult part of that surgery is to create this little dissection around the cystic duct, okay? And um, you can see here in those videos, different cases, I use right angle forceps, okay? So a five millimeter right angle forceps here. And it's better to dissect parallel to the cystic duct. Don't dissect perpendicular to it, okay? So go in a parallel direction, so you have much less risk of damaging the cystic duct like this way. So you can see here, I go back and forth on each side, okay? And create a nice uh, windows on each side there. And you can see now the forceps is getting around that. The problem with those right angle forceps, they're always a bit too short, okay? The angle and the length of the five millimeters or the 10 millimeters are always too short. And it's always frustrating. So that's why I switch to an articulated instrument and then when you use an articulated instrument, you can really, at the end, since it's articulated, you can turn it to a 90 degree angle, and then you get a very long instrument that can go very easily 
around the whole cystic duct. You, you can see on the video here, and then it facilitates that dissection greatly, okay? So get one of those articulated instruments dissecting forceps, okay? And then you'll be able to create that nice window all the way around the cystic duct and get it dissected 360 degree around, okay? And so that made a huge difference when I figured that out. And then after you establish your plane of dissection, you're going to have to control the cystic duct and control the cystic artery, okay? Like I said at the beginning, in dogs, we don't have to worry too much about the cystic artery. It's so close to the cystic duct that almost every time I occluded it with uh, my uh, uh, technique that I used to occlude the cystic duct. I never had to ligate the cystic artery separately. So you have all kinds of different techniques to control the cystic duct and the cystic artery. You can use sutures, okay? So you can place a suture around the duct, pre-tight your suture outside of the abdominal cavity, and then um, bring the suture down into the, around the cystic duct. Or if you're good at it, you can do endocorporeal, uh, intracorporeal suturing. So place the suture, tie your knot intra-abdominally and tie it this way, which is perfectly fine. You can use clips and use large 10 millimeter clips. Okay, I insist on the fact they are to be large, okay? Large means they are longer. They are not larger, but they are just longer, which means they are going to cover completely the cystic duct. Or you can use a vessel sealant device, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Or you can use staples like endo-GIAs. I've used this endo-GIA now in two cases where the cystic duct never tapered down and stayed pretty wide the whole time. So my 10 millimeter clips, even the large one, where would have been too short to do it. And I was too lazy to pass a suture and tie a knot. So I used an endo GIA that I placed over uh, the cystic duct that was very enlarged. So if you have access to those endo GIA, you can use them. And that's a study I did in 2014 with my resident at the time, Dr. Marvin, which is a faculty now here at CSU. And that's what we did. We took a bunch of biliary tract from uh, dog cadavers that were freshly euthanized for reason unrelated to that study. And we clipped their cystic duct with different techniques, okay? So we used a large 10 millimeter endoclips. We used a medium 10 millimeter endoclips, and then we used a ligature. And then we pressurized their biliary system and tried to figure out when they start leaking. And you can see that the large 10 millimeter endoclip leaks around 100 to 110 millimeters of mercury, which is way beyond physiologic values, even if you have biliary obstruction, okay? Then you see the ligature was around 90, okay, which is fine. And then you look at the medium endoclip. The medium endoclip, the medium was around 70, which is still good but you can see the spread and some of them leaked around 35, 40, and that starts to be a little bit scary. And that's the reason why those ones were leaking is because the medium endoclips were not long enough to cover completely the cystic duct. And a tiny little portion of the duct was not, complete, was not covered by the clip. And that's probably where it started leaking. So that's why we don't want to use the medium one, but the large one, because they are long enough to cover everything. Now you will say the ligature here seems safe. I will agree. I mean, it looks safe, but remember those dogs were normal dog, okay, with normal biliary system. It's not a biliary system from a dog with a, a early mucosal or cholecystitis. And if you look at the human data, they had some problems with ligature on diseased biliary systems. So right now I stay with my large 10 millimeter clips and I've never had a dog developing peritonitis after surgery. Knock on wood, I hope it never happened. And uh, so I put three clips, okay? And I put two clips far down that are going to stay in the patient, so close to the common bile duct. And then I put a third clip a little bit closer to the gallbladder, okay? So keeping enough space in between the two distal clips and the one more proximal clip, so I have enough space to go and do my, um, my incision. So you can see here, you can see on the top right image, those clips are covering completely the cystic duct. So there is no chance for those clips to have a tiny bit of the cystic duct still open. 
And I always put two. That's what is recommended in Newman, put at least two. If you have the space to put three, you can put three if you want to. But that's what is recommended in Newman, put at least two clips, okay? They are a couple of millimeters from each other. The thing is you don't want to touch those clips afterwards. They are safe, but you don't want to touch them because that will be easy to dislodge them if you put too much tension on them. And that's when you want to have a good plane of dissection so you can completely engage your clip applicator all the way in there, okay? And what is important also when you apply those clips, usually clip applicators are going to load the clip when you start triggering the, the handle. It is very, very important. Don't apply the clip, is already the clip engaged into the clip applicator because you have a chance to tear the duct if you do that. So apply the, put the clip applicator over the duct without a clip engaged into the clip applicator and then trigger the clip applicator the clip will come out and then we close the, the cystic duct. It's a very, very important thing to do because if you don't pay attention to that, you have a chance to tear your, your cystic duct. So that's what I mentioned here. You want to apply your clips away from the connection with a common bile duct to avoid the problems that you see here. It is probably the most common problem they have in human surgeries is obstructing the common bile duct. So that's why they apply those two forceps that like I showed you to open this angle to avoid uh, clipping the common bile duct. So usually in dogs, we don't have this problem because we have no cystic duct. But that's why in human, they develop this um, technology now with uh, infrared lights and the endocyne and green. So that helps them during surgery to do a cholangiogram without damaging the cystic duct, okay? So you can inject, in human, they inject their um, endocyne and green 70 minutes before surgery, okay? And then you know endocyne and green is eliminated by the biliary system. And if you're old enough, you probably know that endocyne and green was used probably 30 years ago or maybe 35 years ago to evaluate liver function. But anyway, uh, so you, if you inject this endocyne and green long before surgery, it's going to collect into the biliary system and it's going to allow you to visualize your common bile duct, your cystic duct, and your gallbladder, okay? So that's something that's been used in human, okay? And we started to work with it here at CSU to do some research on that. And here, on those cases, um, we've been injecting the endocyne and green 40 minutes before, okay? and use a dose of five milligrams for a 30 kilo dog, okay? And we've been watching those dogs every 10 minutes, okay? And usually by 40 minutes, we start to have a nice view of the common bile duct and the cystic duct. So you can see on this case, the bottom right picture is a normal view that you will get. And you see a little bit of the common bile duct already in this dog, but it's not always that easy to see it. And then you can see at the uh, bottom left, you can see the uh, infrared lights, okay, with the endocyne and green. And you can see this nice blue fluorescence, okay, there, because that's the technology we use, make them blue, okay. And then the top left picture is the same image, but using different filters to enhance the picture, okay. So you can see, you can visualize very nicely the common bile duct and the cystic duct. So, we are there right now and more research needs to be done, probably injecting sooner and maybe at a higher dose of endocyne and green will give us a much better image. So tons of research to do on this, but that's where we are with this. So then after you apply your clip, okay, you'll have to cut the cystic duct and it's recommended in human to try to leave at least a quarter of a centimeter of cystic duct distal to your uh, most proximal clip. Okay, so those two clips that are going to stay in a patient here, see I'm trying to leave uh, a quarter of a centimeter as much as I can. If the clip on the, close to the apex of the, of the bladder gets dislodged, this one is not a big deal, because that is going to come out with the patient. Okay, so it's going to contaminate a little bit the abdominal cavity, but that's not going to be a big problem. So at least try to leave at least a quarter of a centimeter of bile duct past your clips that are going to stay in the patient. And then from there, you're going to start your dissection, okay? From there, and just peel the gallbladder away from uh, the uh, fossa of the quadrate lobe. 
And what is important here, okay, you have two little pillars that are attaching the cystic duct and the very distal part of the gallbladder to the liver. As soon as you dissect through those two pillars here, your gallbladder is going to peel off extremely quickly, okay? And it's not a joke. I mean, it peels away very nicely and very quickly after you have been able to recognize those two little pillars there, okay? And you can see on this case here, a little bit better, I go with my vessel sealant device and I seal and cut those two little pillars here that are attaching the gallbladder. So I've done with one, and I'm going to go through the second one here. You can see it showing up a little bit at the bottom here of the gallbladder. So if you go with your vessel sealant device, seal and cut that, you can do it with cautery also. I will not do it with plain scissors, but it could bleed a lot of it. Sometimes there is some little blood vessel in there. So you come right here, you grab that, okay? And you go and seal that, activate the vessel sealant device and cut this. And as soon as you get that done, it's amazing. The gallbladder is going to peel away very quickly from there. You can see that, okay? And you can see it here. I'm just going with my vessel sealant device. Sometime a little bit of liver parenchyma can get stuck here. I'm going to reuse the vessel sealant device to reestablish a better plane of dissection. But no kidding. I mean, if you get into that nice plane, see sometimes you have a little bit of fibers here, some little ducts that you can see. But if you get into that nice plane of dissection, first you're going to get very limited bleeding, okay? And the gallbladder peels away in five minutes, okay? And uh, so that's what I'm going to do. And you can see we are very, very limited uh, bleeding in those cases. If you have a little bit of bleeding, uh, watch it. Use your flushing suctioning device to clear the surgical field if you have to. And sometimes I've seen in humans, they will go back with their cautery and increase the power of the cautery unit and fulgurate a little bit the, the liver parenchyma just to stop the bleeding if it's a diffuse bleeder there. And you can see now we're getting to the uh, apex. And that's where you're going to have a little bit of an, of an attachment again at the apex of the gallbladder there. So again, with my vessel sealant device, I will just do that, okay? And just seal it this way. So you can see now that's where we are. And I'm just helping now just directing those people doing the surgery. But you can see we have the vessel sealant device going in and we're just sealing the, the tissue. So like I said, you're going to use your uh, suctioning irrigation device if you need to. So either you have a very dedicated um, suctioning irrigation device, if you don't have one, you can use your regular instruments and take all the instruments and use just the tubing of your regular instruments to do that, or you can use a red rubber feeding tubes and go and flush and suction into the, the tissue here. So you can see here, we're just flushing and suctioning to keep the surgical field pretty clean. His dog had more serious adhesions, he had a little bit more inflammation going on, so we had to go and just do that and use the suctioning irrigation system, but that's not very common when we have to do this. If the gallbladder is too big, then we'll go from the apex now. And that's a bit harder to do because you need to establish a good plane of dissection in between the gallbladder and the liver. Okay? And that's always hard because you have pretty strong adhesions at the top there, like you've already seen in the previous video. So usually I work with a combination of cautery and a vessel sealant device to create that plane of dissection. The problem is, is we cannot grab the liver. So I, with a probe, I push the liver out of the way and try to go with a um, cautery and a J-hook, trying to establish my plane of dissection. What you have to do here and be careful, you have to remember in a 3D dimension, this gallbladder kind of is dome shape. So if you don't remember this, if you go straight in, you have a chance to puncture the gallbladder, okay? So always remember, it's kind of a dome shape. So you try to follow that curvature and then after you start to establish the plane of dissection, like you can see here, then you can start to go with a vessel sealant device in the surgical plane you created. And then you'll be able to go all the way down to the um, cystic duct and then ligate the cystic duct last, okay? And so like here, you can either put three clips and that's the cases where I had to use an endo GI8. So when those gallbladders were big and heavy, I had to go with the endo GIA at the base. I could have used sutures too if I wanted to. 
And then when you're done, you have to pull the gallbladder outside of the abdominal cavity. That's when I like to use a retrieving bag, okay? Makes it a bit easier to retrieve the gallbladder, less chance to uh, blow up the gallbladder and then have bile all over the abdominal cavity. So I like to put them in a bag, okay, and do that. And uh, some of the people have brought the gallbladder right against the abdominal wall, stuck a needle in it and tried to deflate the gallbladder. But if they start to be too well organized as a mucosid, it's, it's hard to do that. And uh, so then what I do, I enlarge a cannula hole. Or if I use a seal sport, usually they come straight through the seal sport without any problem. Complication I've had in surgery is perforation of a gallbladder. I've done that. It has happened to me, like I mentioned, with a grasping forceps, and I was probably too aggressive. And so I punctured the gallbladder. And um, the first one, it happens to me, I just converted it, and then did some more readings in the human literature, and in human, they don't convert, okay, with a perforation of a gallbladder. And Dr. Kanai published this paper, and in his paper, he perforated 16 gallbladders and didn't convert them, okay? And what they do in human, when they perforate a gallbladder, they grab them with the forceps and twist them like kind of a spaghetti around their forceps to seal the hole, okay? That's what they do. And the good thing is, since we do those surgeries in mucosil, it's not a liquid bile. So not much bile will leak out. Okay, so if it happens to me again, I will do definitely the twisting uh, things like they recommend in human. Okay, so grab it, twisting it around your forceps like here, and then flush uh, copiously the abdominal cavity. So then we have a nice flushing and cleaning and don't have a risk of having peritonitis afterwards. So any questions on this before I keep going? Do you have a sense as to how many were successfully managed medically? Oh, how many were managed medically? It's more a question for you. Um, in the literature, for what I can remember from what's been done medically, the success rate is pretty low, okay? And um, maybe you have a better answer than me, but uh, remembering that, yeah, medical treatment, if it's done appropriately, I mean, the chance of... of getting those dogs and resorbing their mucosid is very low. Yeah, I, I guess I would agree as well. And if I had a mucosil and surgery was not an option, I would do medical, but I would probably recommend surgery. Mm -hmm. We have a question about, is any increase in bilirubin with a mucosil a contraindication for laparoscopic cholecystectomy? Yeah, I mean, that's like I explained at the beginning. I mean, right now I try to only dogs with normal bilirubin level and um, because of my fear of having an obstruction, I'm starting to change my mind right now. And uh, I will consider doing surgery if I have a good indication that I don't have very, very distended biliary system on ultrasound in those patients. So I'm starting to change my mind a little bit. So I will accept some elevated bilirubin level, how high will I accept? I don't know, okay? And I've done cases where in the history, they, you could see they were definitely bilirubin level at two or three and then came back down to normal. So those one, I will consider doing it. And I don't have a cutoff limit right now, but I have a tendency to consider doing them now if their bilirubin level is above normal uh, right now. What about uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy in cats? Um, well, it's very rare to do cholecystectomy in cats, and uh, I don't remember doing a cat. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's possible. I mean, uh, the only challenge in a cat is now much smaller, obviously, so probably switching to a little instrument, so like uh, pediatric instruments that are 2.7 millimeters in diameter will probably be more appropriate. Okay, and that's what they call needle scoping now. Even smaller instruments can exist now. So, but yeah, cats will be possible too. Is there any limitation regarding the size of the gallbladder seen on ultrasound to contraindicate laparoscopic cholecystectomy? No, I don't have any contraindication on size of the gallbladder. If the gallbladder is too big, like I said, I will have to start my dissection from the apex, okay? And that makes the surgery a little bit harder to do, but I don't have a size limitation, no, based on interest on no. 
What vessel sealing device do you use most often? Well, I use those five millimeters and uh, the one you saw in the videos where either the dolphin tips, but now they have the Maryland jaws that are a bit curved and that's my preferred one now, the one at the Maryland, little curved tip five millimeter vessel sealant device. And uh, the one we have here is a ligature. I mean, I have no um, benefits from ligature to recommend using it. That's the one we have, that's the one I'm using. I know some other people have used different types and they seems to be working very well. I've been using recently um, ultrasound dissections and I have to admit ultrasound dissection allows more precise dissection than a vessel sealant device. So I'm starting to use the ultrasound dissector a little bit too. I haven't talked about it here because I don't have enough experience, but it's something I'm thinking now using more and more often too. What's your preferred five millimeter grasping forceps to manipulate the gallbladder? Yeah, my forceps of choice for anything I do is going to be the fine, fine, five millimeter fine tees of Babcock forceps, okay? Even if it does have little tees, it's not that big, it's not very traumatic. So that's what I use most of the time. That's no matter what I do in laparoscopy, that's the one I'm using. Um, do you ever empty the gallbladder before surgery? Does that help? Yeah, I've tried that. It's a good question. I've tried that, but um, in some of those big gallbladders thinking, hey, I'm going to be smarter than you and I'm going to drain this. The problem, they are mucosal and it's impossible to drain them unless you put a very big needle in there and then you have a chance to contaminate the abdominal cavity. So, I've only tried to do it percutaneously with a needle. Maybe we'll be smarter to make an incision in the gallbladder and stick a big suction tip in there. Maybe something that will be done. I'm not gutsy enough to do this. So right now I've only tried to drain them with a needle and I haven't been successful. Um, I guess this question, I don't quite understand it. Um, how do you handle uh, cases where the cystic duct has a lot of accumulation of sludge or mucosal and extending into the cystic duct. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mentioned here. If the cystic duct gets distended, okay, that's where I use the endo-GIA. If you don't have the endo-GIA, then you'll have to put sutures around it. So be ready to do intracorporeal suturing. And I know the paper that was published by Dr. Singh with the multi-institutional studies they've put a few sutures in there in those big uh, bile ducts. So that will be the other alternative there is to use sutures or if you have access to endo-GIA, use an endo-GIA. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions was using gauze to make the dissection of the gallbladder, I guess, away from the, the liver. Yeah, I know. In human, they do that a lot. And I'm, I don't know, I'm always concerned of putting a, a, a gauze into the abdominal cavity. And yeah, I know in human, I've watched some human surgeons, I've watched some videos from human surgeons and they are not afraid to do that and use the gallbladder to help, uh, use the gas to hold the gallbladder and tease the gallbladder away or push over the liver with that. Um, I always afraid to leave chunks of the pieces of the, gold, of the gas into the abdomen. I don't feel comfortable doing this. I know some people use those cherry picker things, those little, uh, kind of like a palpation probe with a cotton ball at the end to do the dissection too. Um, I've, I haven't done that, but I know it's, it's done, yes. Okay, I think that uh, gets most all of our questions at this point. Okay, so I'll keep going. So basically, um, that's the indications. It's gallbladder mucosal sludge cholecystitis. That's what I'm going to do without occlusion of the bile duct. In humans, they're very careful with cholecystitis, okay? If they're getting pretty severe, stage two or stage three, they're not going to do a laparoscopy. They only do it for its very early cholecystitis, which is what I've done here, okay? And make sure that the bile duct is patent. So what is the conversion rate? I mean, if you read the literature, it goes from four to 30%, okay? There is a wide spectrum here in the veterinary field. Okay, in the human field, conversion rates is probably less than 3% right now. So it's very, very low, but they have a huge amount of experience. 
And conversions, in my experience and reading the literature and reading the, the three papers pretty much that have been published in the veterinary field, is mostly adhesions, bleeding, or anatomical difficulties. Okay? And it's the same in humans. That's the three main reasons why they are converting or why we are converting um, uh, cold, cold blood, I mean, cholecystectomies. And originally, I had a few cases where they had a lot of mental adhesions, and I just quit right away. And I did a dog not a long time ago that had some adhesions because he had an history of a liver abscess in the past. And I was able to peel away all those adhesions, clean it, and then I was able to do the cholecystectomy in that case. So as we get more and more comfortable, probably those adhesions can, uh, may not be a big problem there, but that's definitely what's, what's going on here. So if you look at the literature, the first paper was published by Dr. Mayhew in 2008, and he reported six cases. And again, they were cases without bile duct obstruction. They were early mucosal kind of. He excluded two cases from his study because they converted them. And all those dogs did really well. He had eight months follow-ups. He didn't have any peritonitis or any other problem in those cases, did very well. He ligated the bile duct with sutures in that study. So that was the first study there that was very interesting and, and the, the starting points of all this laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And then there was a paper uh, from Dr. Scott, which was a multi-institutional study that came out in 2016 on 20 cases. And here the conversion rate was pretty high, 30%. And most of their conversion was coming from difficulty of ligating the cystic ducts. That's when they use a lot of sutures and place sutures around on top of clips of different techniques. And again, it's a multi-institutional study. So you're combining a lot of different learning curves. Okay, so that's increasing your conversion rates just there because of that. So it's not a good reflection of really what's going on there. And they had one case that the gallbladder was ruptured in that case, but that was a nice uh, study again showing that it's probably easy to do that. And the long-term follow-up, those dogs did really well. And then you get the study from Dr. Kanai from Japan that was published in 2018 with 76 cases. So that's the largest, biggest study we have in the veterinary field right now. And in Japan, they started to do those laparoscopic cholecystectomy a long time ago, and they've been much more aggressive than we've been with this, maybe for good reasons, I don't know, but uh, that's what they've been doing. And Dr. Kenai in his study, like I mentioned, he's been doing some cholangiogram, not all of them, okay, but he's been doing it, okay, and uh, he showed that the technique is feasible and uh, helped him visualize and document the common bile duct is patent. Interestingly, also in his study, 16 cases had ruptured of the gallbladder or they got ruptured during surgeries, okay, and he used suctioning and irrigations and clamping techniques, but he didn't never convert any of those dogs and they did well, okay? So that's interesting to notice that in that study. But something that is very interesting, it's down to a 4% conversion rate, okay? So showed you that with experience and you go over that learning curves, you get very low rate of conversion. Now it would have been me, those 16 cases with rupture, I would have converted them, which will have increased my conversion rates dramatically. So that's a, one of the reasons why this conversion rate is very low. And that's interesting is the mortality rate is 5%, okay? Which is very good. And when you remember what I said at the beginning, it's up to 30% if you have obstructions. And if it's an elective, you'll get down to a very, very low mortality rate like he's been getting in that study. So it's a very good study and is supportive also very nicely of the benefits of doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So great study here. And then the other study I published with my residents, Dr. Simon, uh, we published that in Bed Search last year in, in 2019. And we reported 15 cases that we did with the seal sports. We've done many more cases with uh, multiple cannulas. We didn't put them in that study. So we went already over the learning curves with the multiple uh, cannula approach. So we went kind of over our learning curves here. But even with that, we still had the 20% conversion rates, okay? One of them were converted because of the rupture of the gold ladder. Maybe now I will probably not convert it now that I know better, okay? And putting an extra cannula definitely speed up the surgery and help us, didn't change the conversion rates, okay? Because uh, it was hard to figure that out in our studies because 
very early on, we didn't put the extra cannula. We then we added the cannula afterwards. So it was a combination of adding a cannula and again experience of the surgeons and the learning curve. So it was hard to do that. But my gut feeling right now is adding the extra cannula makes the surgery faster, easier, and probably will drop the conversion rates to a much more acceptable level. I mean, 20% is still high, okay, but it's still acceptable. I mean, we haven't affected the, the, the mortality rate. All of our cases survive and left the hospital, so it was fine, but uh, probably extra cannula will facilitate the whole surgery. And in human, I mean, when they do laparoscopic cholecystectomy, it's always, almost always a four cannula procedure. So basically, in conclusion, I mean, cholecystectomies with laparoscopy is definitely acceptable in dogs. I mean, now we have three uh, good studies, or four good studies now that show that good uh, outcome. Okay, we are not increasing mortality rate in those dogs. We are not increasing morbidity, which is important. We are still doing it with non-obstructed bile duct, and we might move forward now and go to some more advanced cases or more complicated cases, but Probably laparoscopic cholecystectomy, it's probably one of the most challenging surgeries I've done with laparoscopy or minimally invasive right now. So definitely be very familiar with your anatomy, uh, work with your positioning, work with your cannula placement, and you'll go through a steep learning curve. So, I mean, I can tell you the first few cases you're going to do, you're going to get really frustrated. So learn on cadavers, practice on cadavers, practice your positioning of your patient, practice positioning of your cannulas to get comfortable with it and get a good assistant too. Okay, it's going to be very important because if your assistant cannot follow what you're doing, it's going to become very frustrating. So that's all I have on that topic. So if you have any questions, other questions or anything. Uh, I think we're good on questions, Derek. Uh, thank you so much. It was a great uh, webinar. And I'd like to thank the audience for joining us for Endoscopy Talks. Next week, we will have Dr. Mike Willard, who will speak on endoscopic electrosurgery. So if you do any flexible GI endoscopy and you want to get into um, interventional uh, endoscopy, I'd encourage you to attend. That is Dr. Willard next Wednesday, August 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, that's New York time. So wishing you all good practice, good health, and looking forward to seeing you again, uh, hopefully next week. Thanks a lot. <laughs>